Today we're in Matthew 13. We're going to be looking at verses 44 through 53. And uh, we're going to be looking at the last parables that Jesus gives here in Matthew 13. As I mentioned to you in our introduction, Jesus gives eight parables. And so we'll be looking at the final four parables as we look at these verses. Allow me to begin reading at verse 44. I'll read to verse 53 and we'll get into our study. Matthew 13, beginning at verse 44, reading to verse 53. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to the shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he asked them, then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. And so Jesus, as mentioned a moment ago, has been giving a series of parables. Chapter 13 contains eight parables that Jesus has given concerning the kingdom of heaven. When we looked at the first four parables, the first four parables that we looked at uh, were, were concerning uh, men's responses to God's kingdom. And so we saw the parable of the sower and the seed. And, and this particular parable gave us four responses to the gospel. And remember with me, three of those responses were negative, but the fourth one was positive and became fruitful. Then we saw the wheat and the tares. And that parable revealed that the visible church would be asleep and would be infiltrated. We looked at the parable of the mustard seed. And the parable of the mustard seed portrayed the visible church growing, but becoming a nesting place filled with evil. We saw the parable of the leaven. And the leaven revealed the church permeated with sins, sins like hypocrisy and doctrinal error and uh, the lack of love. And as Jesus was giving these initially, he gave these first four parables. Remember with me that in verse 43, he concluded by simply saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That gives to us the responsibility of hearing. That gives to me the responsibility of hearing what the Spirit has to say to the church. And hearing with faith and understanding is important. It's especially important for the believer. Hearing is more than the ability to simply physically hear. When you read hearing, it is especially relating to receiving, not only hearing, but receiving and acting upon that which we're listening to. And so when the Lord is speaking concerning hearing in this context, that would include utilizing spiritual discernment. Mark and Luke both communicate concerning this when they're speaking concerning how to receive instruction. And that gives us a deeper insight because in Mark chapter 4, verse 24, Mark writes, he said to them, take heed what you hear. And then in Luke chapter 8, verse 18, Luke says that Jesus said, therefore, take heed how you hear. Be careful what you're hearing and be careful how you are hearing. That speaks concerning spiritual discernment, a utilization of that which God has given to us to appropriate what God would have for us. So when Jesus was speaking here, he was intending people to pursue the truer and deeper meaning of the words that he was using. And so we hear with a heart of faith as well as a heart of determination, not only to hear what is being said, but also to obey what the Spirit would be saying. Now, obviously, we, we falter. We're never completely faithful. 
but it is our desire to obey God's word consistently. None of us is going to be able to live a perfect life this side of heaven. But it's never to be used as an excuse either to continue in sin. Sometimes people will say, well, I'm just a person made of flesh. God knows that. And indeed, that's true. But God has given to all, the, all things that pertain to life and godliness. And when he gave to us his Holy Spirit, he also empowered us to be able to be obedient. So we never make excuse for the continuation of sin. And we never say that God's grace enables us to continue in sin and continue on to heaven. Because that would be a, a misrepresentation and a misappropriation of, of what grace actually is. Because what God would intend for us is to, to not only hear, but to hear and to put into practice, to hear and to obey and to follow him with all the power that he has given to us. And so the Lord here is speaking concerning responses and has so far been re speaking concerning responses to, to uh, stories, parables that relate to the kingdom of God. And so he continues on now to give other parables. He's going to continue with four more parables and he's speaking concerning um, of the kingdom of God and continuing to do so. So as we look at verse 44, and we'll take verses 44 through 46 first and look at this, he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So he continues now to give four more parables. Now, as I look at this, I want to make, make sure that I develop something by saying first what he's not saying, because when you read what he's saying in verse 44, and I'll look at it again, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. There are those who would say, well, this looks like Jesus is saying it's okay to be deceitful, greedy, and dishonest. Because a guy comes across some treasure in a field and decides to buy that field so he can get that treasure. So it looks to me like Jesus is saying that it's okay to, to have no ethics, to, to be a thief. So let's begin by first saying that Jesus is not encouraging deception to gain what one greedily desires. What he's doing is he's using an illustration that everybody would be familiar with. You see, during, during his day, the practice of burying valuables was very common. Most people hid their valuables by burying them in a secret place. Over the long history of Israel, Israel had been attacked many times, and families often would bury valuables to keep them out of the hand of those who would plunder. You see, if, if I were there living in Israel, and I had buried my, my treasures in the field that I owned, if I was taken captive, I might be released, and when I'm released, I can go back to my field and I can find those things that were valuable to me. I could retrieve my goods. You see, over the centuries, because they had a long history, Israel had become somewhat of a treasure field. And so hidden treasure was occasionally found by inhabitants of the land. When it was found, it was permissible for them to keep what was found. So Jesus is not teaching that greed is permissible and blessed by God. Now, we're living in a time when words have to be defined because we, we don't necessarily know what those words mean anymore. The word greed is an intense and selfish desire for something, especially power, food, or wealth. And God does not bless greed. We need to be very careful to say that on the onset. God's word speaks specifically against it Proverbs 15, 27 says, A greedy man brings trouble to his family. He who hates bribes will live. Proverbs 28, 25 says, A greedy man stirs up dissension, but he who trusts in the Lord will prosper. So Jesus taught that satisfaction in life isn't based on the acquisition of material goods alone. Now, it isn't the material goods in, goods in and of themselves that are evil. I mean... I've heard one scripture misquoted so many times and people will say, money is the root of all evil. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money in and of itself is used as a tool. And sometimes God will bless materially. As a matter of fact, quite often he will bless materially. 
but he blesses those who have a heart for him and take that which he has given to them and use for his kingdom. God will bless you. And, and there's nothing wrong with asking the Lord, uh, provide for me my daily bread. Father, I, I need work. I want to go out and do something labor, and I want to be able to, to pay for my house, pay my bills, feed my children, put clothing on their back. I want to take care of those things, Lord. There's nothing wrong with asking the Lord to provide for you in that way. But Jesus made it very clear that, that the essential possession that we're to have is not necessarily material at all. The essential possession is a relationship, a relationship with God. That's why in Luke 12, 15, Jesus said, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. And he went on to say, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Man's life is not made up essentially of the things that he owns. You are not what you wear. You are not what you drive. You are not where you live. Those are things that, that may express your personal taste and your abilities to purchase, but that doesn't say who you really are. And so we have to be careful to realize that Jesus said, my life doesn't consist in the abundance of material possessions. Someone wrote, possessing the good things of the world cannot prevent diseases nor death, nor do the comfort and happiness of life lie in these things. Eternal life cannot be acquired by possessing any of these things. And so those are things that are outside of materialism. You see, greed often reveals a hunger for something outside of the relationship with the Lord. And in reality, greed is a form of idolatry and as such will exclude a person from salvation. Greed. We think that if we have a lot of money, we're going to be happier, and that's not necessarily true. I was on my way one time to do a men's conference in the city of Las Vegas. So I got on a plane here in the city of Ontario, and we were flying from Ontario to Las Vegas. And, and I'd never been on a plane before going from Ontario or anywhere to Las Vegas, and I couldn't believe it. It was like a party plane. I couldn't believe it. I mean, there were people there just, ah, oh, making all this noise. Oh, you know, they almost had these little hats and these little things, you know, those things. Party favors, you know. And, and I remember looking around, and I was just looking at all these people. I was with a few friends of mine and all, and we were on our way to Las Vegas. And, and they were partying. They were, man, we're on our way. We're going to get rich. Two days later, I'm on, I'm on my way back, and the plane was so quiet. A bunch of losers, you know, they lost everything, right? But on the way, oh, we're going to be rich. We're going to get, you know, I'm going to drop a dollar in a slot and I'm going to walk away with a million dollars and this and that, right? And it just doesn't happen. And one, somebody was once being asked, and I was happening to watch this on, a, on an interview on television. He was a manager of a very large, very expensive uh, hotel in Las Vegas. And he was asked a question by the interviewer. The interviewer said to him, what is it that draws people Las Vegas? He says, what draws people to Las Vegas? He says, yes. He said, in one word, greed. They think they're going to make it. They think they're going to, you know, they're going to play the right number. They're going to pull the right, you know, machine or whatever. Uh, they're going to they're make it. He said, in one word, that which draws people to Las Vegas is greed. It's a desire for materialism because, uh, material things, because they think that if I have this car, if I have this house, if I have these clothes, if I have these shoes, if I have all of these things, that'll make my life better. But a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. The essentials of life are things that God gave to us free. Love, air, food, these are things that are necessities, but certain kinds of things are not. And so Jesus made it very clear. And in fact, greed in Scripture, in and of itself, is declared to be sinful because it reveals a hunger for something outside of a relationship with God. It is, in reality, a form of idolatry and as such will exclude a person from salvation. How do we know that? Well, Ephesians 5, verse 5, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person. Such a man is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Greed is one of those sins that has replaced God with a material possession. So with that in mind, Jesus is not teaching the unethical acquisition of someone else's property. Be very careful that you don't pursue something to the loss of your family. Be careful that you don't pursue something that you think will 
in time enrich you to the loss of your family. There are a lot of men who work and work and work so that they can accumulate enough so they can take their leisure and ultimately relax and in doing so have lost months and years in their family life that they'll never regain. They'll never have it back. You gained the world, Jesus said, but you lost your soul. You pursued that which you thought would satisfy you to your own hurt. And so the Lord never says, pursue these things. Paul said, having things to eat and drink. He said, these are the things that I'm satisfied with life because God will give to us those things freely as we serve him. And if we keep those things in terms of in the proper perspective, our life is going to be blessed by him. Jesus is not teaching the unethical acquisition of someone else's property. So as we look at this particular parable, it relates to a man digging in a field, the first one. Now, this individual that Jesus speaks about when he speaks of this treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, this particular illustration or parable would be speaking more than likely of a man who's, who's renting, and he's renting this particular portion of, of uh, land, and he's working the field. And as he's working the field, he, he discovers there's buried treasure. The buried treasure presumably had been left by a previous owner. Now, it would have been a previous owner, not the present owner, because if the present owner knew that there was treasure in the field, he would have retrieved that treasure before he sold the property. So the treasure didn't belong to the present owner. He wasn't aware of its presence. If he had known, then the treasure would not have been included in the deal. You see, rabbinic law permitted a buyer to purchase a field and to keep anything that they found in it. The law states, if a man finds scattered fruit or money, it belongs to the finder. We used to have this little thing that we'd say, finders keepers, losers what, weepers. We used to say that, finders keepers, finders keepers, losers weepers. Well, in rabbinic law, if I found something on property, and, and all under certain circumstances, if I find scattered fruit or money, it would belong to the one who found it. And so if the man in the, in the parable, if the man were not honest, he would simply have taken the treasure without bothering to sell all that he had to purchase it. And somebody would ask, well, why not just take the money and purchase the field with the money that he found? So with this said, what is it that the Lord intends to teach us in this parable? as well as the pearl of great price. And, and so if you take notes, what he intends to teach us in the parable of hidden treasure and the pearl of great price is the cost of salvation. That's what he's illustrating. Now we learn things about the kingdom of heaven from these parables. In verse 44, that particular parable, the treasure in a field, gives us insight into the treasure. The treasure is the church. The field is would represent the world. The man who found the treasure is God. And what does he do? Well, he sells everything he has. He buys the field that he might obtain the treasure. What is the price? Well, it says here, he sold everything he had. And so that great cost would illustrate that the price is Jesus Christ. When you tie that into the second, in verses 45 and 46, the parable of the pearl of great price, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That also illustrates to us the cost. It gives us three basic things, if you take notes, three basic things about salvation. One, it reveals to us, and notice with me in verse 44 as well as uh, verse 45, notice with me that it is God who is doing the seeking. Neither the uh, treasure nor the pearl is seeking to be found or even to be purchased. And that's because they're not even aware of the fact that they're hidden from sight. And so the bottom line is, is that those who are lost it, it, very often don't even know that they are lost. They think that they're fine. 
but they are lost. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And so we are lost and gone astray and don't even realize it sometimes. People, I think, are doing just fine. But the Bible from Genesis to Revelation portrays man as being lost and Jesus as the one who seeks them out. God seeks them out. In Romans 3, 11 and 12, it says, there is none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way and they are together become unprofitable. There's none who does good. No, not one. So there's none who seeks after God. God is the one seeking after man. And so one, we see that God is the one who's seeking out. He goes into this, into this field and he, and he finds this hidden treasure. And he goes and he finds a beautiful pearl and he, and he sells all that he has. And so one, it reveals that God initiates this. And second, it re reveals that God pays a great price for the treasure as well as for the pearl. So he went out, the Bible says, and he sold all that he had to buy the field and to buy that pearl. The story is of a man, a missionary, who spent many years in the nation of India. And as he was going about for many, many years, over 40 years of doing mission work in, in India, his time of service had come to an end and it was time for him to leave. And so he is going to different people and he was speaking to them one last time. And he went up to this man that he'd been witnessing to for many, many years and uh, once again said to him, I'm about to leave, I've appreciated our friendship, but I want to once again ask you, will you not receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And the Indian man whom he's speaking to says to him, I have told you many times that I cannot do so because you have said to me that that God wants to give to me eternal life. And I do not believe that such a gift can come without me paying a great price for it myself. So no, I cannot receive what you claim to be a free gift when in fact I believe you have to do something to purchase it. But I want to give to you something in, in honor of our friendship. You've been a good friend to me over the years, and, and I have something that's very, very dear to me that I want you to have because I've come to love you very much. And this older man, this Indian man, reaches into his pocket and pulls out a dirty handkerchief and, and hands this handkerchief to the missionary. And as the missionary feels the weight in that handkerchief, he, he opens it up and he looks, and in the midst of that handkerchief on the palm of his hand rests a huge black pearl, the most perfect pearl he had ever seen. And as he looks at this, he says, this is without price. This is, this is too valuable. I, I can't take this from you. Take it back. He says, no. The old man says, no, I want to give it to you. It, it shows you my love for you and my esteem for you. It's a gift to you. No, I, I want you to have that. And the missionary says, no, I can't take it. This is a very price uh, is, is, is a very costly, very pricey gift. I, I can't take it from you. And the man says to him, listen, you need to understand something you didn't know that you will now know. The Indian man says, I had a son, and my son was the best pearl diver in the area. And one day my son went down, and as he went down, he went down deep, and he found an oyster, and as he was working the oyster, he opened it and he found this pearl. But he had gone down too deep and he had been in the water too long. And when he was coming to the surface, he didn't have enough air and he drowned. He says, the men went in and retrieved his body. And when they retrieved his body and pulled him up, his hand was closed on this pearl. They opened his hand and they found this pearl. And he said, it's a gift to you. I cannot sell to you what costs the life of my son. It's without price. And the missionary said, no, let me buy it 
Let me buy this from you. He said, no, I can't sell it to you. Let me buy it from you. No. He said, name your price. No, you don't understand. It cost my son his life. I cannot sell to you what cost him his life. And the man said, you mean that that pearl is without price? And he said, yes, it has to come as a gift. It cannot come at, at your cost. And he said, and that is the grace of God. God sent his son to die on a cross for you, something you couldn't purchase by your own works. You receive it by faith. It's a gift that God gives to you. It's the pearl without price. And that's what God would have for us, is the pearl without price. You can't work your way into the kingdom of heaven because the sacrifice of the Son of God was too costly. It's too costly. It is something that cost the Lord his life. In Isaiah 53, 10, it says, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. God says that he loved the world so much he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God initiates it. God pays the great price for it. Indeed, redemption is costly. Psalm 49, verses 7 through 9 says, No man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay. The, 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 the cost of redemption is, is very high. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, You know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. In Ephesians 1, 7, Paul said, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And so God initiates, he pays a great price, and there's great joy in finding the treasure. Notice again in verse 44 how it says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. There is great joy in the kingdom of heaven. And when God finds the treasure, God rejoices. There is a, another portion of scripture, it's found in Luke 15, where the Lord Jesus Christ speaks concerning a lost sheep and a lost coin and a lost son. And when he's speaking concerning the lost sheep and the lost coin, he illustrates the joy that occurs when, when that, when that sheep or that coin is found by saying in Luke 15, 10, likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God. It, it has been said that the angels are rejoicing, but it seems to me that it's God who is rejoicing in front of the angels. So when one person comes to faith in Christ, there is great joy in heaven, and that's what Jesus is illustrating here for great, with great joy because he has found that which was lost. And so God initiates salvation, he pays the great price, and he rejoices when that person is found. Now, he goes into verse 47 through 50, and he gives another parable, the parable of the dragnet. And he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but notice it threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The parable of the dragnet. This is the seventh parable Jesus teaches. Now, when you look in the history of Israel, you'll notice that there were basically three methods of fishing. There was what we call the hook and line, which we're all familiar with. They also had what is called small net fishing. There would be one fisherman who would, who would uh, be on the shore and he'd throw a small net. And then they had what was called the dragnet. A dragnet was used by a group of fishermen and it would be spread. It could be spread over uh, a half of a square mile. 
and it formed a giant circle. It was weighted in the center, and a team of fishermen in boats would work it. And so it would drop, and then they would just draw it up. Now, the result of this dragnet would be what is called an indiscriminate catch. Whatever was pulled up is just part of the catch. But they would carefully inspect the fish that were pulled up. They'd be sorted. Some would be taken to a distant market. They'd put them in water containers. Some fish were sold locally. They would place them into the basket. But the fish that were not acceptable were discarded. These people knew what Jesus was speaking about when he gave this particular parable. Now, what is he speaking about? He is speaking of final judgment. That's what he says in verse 49 when he says, So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. And he goes on to say, There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So he's speaking of final judgment. And as he's speaking about this, he gives us some insight. He speaks about this judgment. The judgment will be in a place that is reserved for those who've been judged and have rejected. And they will be cast into ultimately what is called the lake of fire. Very often we'll use the word hell. In Revelation 20, it speaks concerning the lake of fire. It's the place of final judgment. Now, this lake of fire, this final judgment, this place of judgment was not created for man. It's interesting to note that it was first created for the devil and fallen angels. In Matthew 25, 41, it says, He will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So it was created as judgment for them. And it's a terrible place to end up. It's been said, he shall have hell as a debt who will not have heaven as a gift. And when people hear the gospel and reject it, it isn't that God wants them to go to hell, it's that they're making a choice to reject what was offered. And it's interesting that Jesus has given this series of parables, but he's coming now to its conclusion and is saying that in the rejection of my word, there are repercussions. There is a place that they will go, and it's a place of judgment. He says that this place is, and when you read Scripture, is revealed to be a, a place of torment and sorrow. You, you can see that when you study in the New Testament, especially in Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 16, there's a portion of Scripture we're all familiar with, a, a, a portion of Scripture that speaks about a rich man and a man who was poor, a man by the name of Lazarus. And so the rich man would eat banquets every day and he the in the in the uh, king james he fared sumptuous sumptuously he ate he ate like a king every day but there was a man who was laid at his at his uh, at his uh, gate by the name of lazarus who was a beggar and he would beg and scrounge for the scraps from this rich man's table and the dogs jesus said would come and actually lick the wounds of Lazarus. And they both died. It says the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. I am in agony in this fire. Somebody once said, it's never true to say something hurts like hell, because nothing hurts like hell. And that's what he's saying, I'm in torment. I'm in torment. Have him come and bring some water for me. I'm, I am thirsty, I am, I am in torment here in this place. And, and so the bottom line, the Lord is saying here, is final judgment comes. And it is a place of torment and it's a, a place of sorrow. That's what the Bible teaches. I mentioned to you recently how, how somebody who used to be in this fellowship, he, he wasn't part of our church. He would visit on occasion. I had, I had met him. He was actually the husband of, a, of somebody that we knew. And she on occasion would bring him to church. And, and on one occasion he says, oh, I'm going to go to hell. I know that. But all my friends will be there and we'll party. 
Well, the Lord Jesus Christ says, no, you're not going to party. It's a place of torment. It's a, it's a place of pain. And it's a place that he doesn't want you to go. You see, the penalty is eternal. Revelation 20, verse 10 says, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Jesus spoke often of this because he wanted people not to go there. Somebody once said, let not anyone who thinks that fear of hell should be put out of the mind of unsaved man ever suppose that he has the slightest understanding of what Jesus came into the world to say and do. There are many today who will say there is no final punishment. You just die and you become food for worms. Jesus didn't teach that. And as he's speaking, he's making it very clear. He says in verse 50, they will be cast into the furnace of fire and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And after he says that, verse 51, Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he said to them, therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. And now he gives the parable of the householder the eighth and final parable of the chapter. Now notice with me in verse 51, Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? Have you rightly put these things together? Now, I want you to notice this. When he says, have you understood all these things? That will always be the concern of a teacher. Do you understand what you've been taught? Someone said matters of the utmost weight and importance should be considered again and again until they've been thoroughly understood. Now, he'd already been speaking concerning this and how that the, the enemy will come and take from the soil that which has been planted. And so naturally, he wants to reinforce the teaching that the word needs to find a receptive heart. And therefore, he said, do you understand? Have you understood all these things? things. And their response to him is, yes, yes, we have. We've understood. So he goes on to say, therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure, notice, things new and old. Now, what is he saying? This process is part of the way you experience spiritual growth. You have a treasure. You have a treasure of knowledge both of what you have learned and what you are presently learning. So what I have said previously is now to be mixed with what you have recently learned. You're supposed to hear what has been said in the past. That was your foundation. And now you add to that what you've been taught, the things that you're now being taught, and that demonstrates that your edifice of understanding is beginning to grow. You have a foundation, some very basic things. And now Jesus is saying, I'm adding to those things. Listen, it's, it's not enough to enter into the kingdom of heaven as a newborn baby. But we're supposed to move on into young adulthood and then ultimately to become what would be called the father or mother of the faith. You, you aren't supposed to stay a baby. You're supposed to grow. I'm supposed to grow. I'm not supposed to enter in as a baby and remain a baby all of my spiritual life. 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years later, I'm still drinking the milk of the word because I haven't grown to having the meat of the word. And so what he would be saying is, he's saying that you need to take what has been given to you previously, add to it what you're learning, and that creates in you a maturity, a level of understanding. And the way that you actually grow in your maturity isn't simply intellectually assenting to things that are said, but it's putting into practice the things that are said and building your life on that so that you are not only hearing, but you are also doing. And in the hearing and the doing, you're maturing. That's how it works. The Bible in Proverbs 1.5 says, let the wise listen and add to their learning. Let the discerning get guidance. Proverbs 9 verse 9, instruct a wise man, he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man and he will add to his learning. And so that's why you'll hear from this pulpit me encouraging you to not simply be a Sunday morning Christian, but to put the word of God into practice daily 
have your devotions. Pick, a, pick up the Bible in the morning and listen to what the Word says. Turn on one of the radio stations on your way to work that teaches and listen to the teaching and grow daily. If you can be in a midweek, if you can be involved in small groups or be involved in various things, do so. It strengthens you. And what happens is the foundation actually has an edifice that is built upon it that is maturing. And you're taking what is being said and you're applying what is being said and you're growing in the understanding of God. And that's how it works. And as you gain, you give. So be wise in the way that you practice these new revelations because in gaining new understanding, you are growing in your maturity as well as your responsibility. And we are to be a growing disciple. We're to hunger for the milk of the word. We're to hunger after righteousness. In 2 Peter 3.18, it says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so not only do we receive, but we also live out what God taught us. James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And then what you do is you share with others what you've received. Notice how he says in verse 52, Who brings out of his treasure. The words bring out is a Greek word, ekbalo. It means to cast out or to drive out. It speaks of sending out or distributing widely what you have learned by study and experience, distribute to others in a wise manner. That's part of your growth process. I got saved, and when I, I got saved, the young man who was discipling me there at the Hollywood Palladium, December 27, 1970, that young man who was discipling said to me, read the word, pray, fellowship, and tell someone about Jesus. That's what he said, four basic things. Read the word, pray, fellowship with other Christians, and tell somebody. And so, I'm 20 years old, I just got saved, I come home, they drop me off at my parents' house, I was living with my parents, I was supposed to have received, not me personally, I was supposed to be smoking some pot that had been received by some friends of mine who lived across the street. And I had gone to this Christian event rather than getting high. And now I cross the street. They, I still remember them, drop, my friends, dropping me off. And I walk across the street rather than going in the house. I crossed the street, crossed another street, went to my friend's house. And as I went into that house, I was looking for my friend Gilbert and baby doll and some of the other people that were there. That's a fact, baby doll. <laughs> they all have nicknames. My friend Gilbert's name was Gigi. His brother was Lolo. I mean, they had all these names. That's the truth. So I'm using their proper names, except for baby doll, Mary Lou. They were dear friends of mine. I'd known them since I was a little boy. So the little boy, they'd lived across the street from us for many years. Their mama, I knew her very well. I was there all the time. I was getting high at their house all the time. We used to go into the garage, close the garage door, and just get high. That's what we did all the time. Now I go across the street, and I walk into the house, and I talk to mom, and I say to her, you know what I just did? Well, what did you do? We're sitting at the dinner table. I say, you know what I just did? I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. i become born again. She looks at me and says, really? I said, yes. And I shared what had happened first thing with her. First thing, they came to faith in Christ. Mary Lou, actually baby doll, actually became a worship leader in the church that she attended. They all came to faith in Christ. The majority of the family did. There were nine kids. The majority of them came to faith in Christ. And so I went and shared with them. Then I crossed the street. Then I went into my parents' den. And I walked in and I looked at them and I said, Mom, Dad, Becky, Madeline, I love you. Praise the Lord. And that's when my two sisters jumped up and came following me as I went into a bathroom, which was right there. And Mama stops while I'm talking to my sisters. And I still remember my dad patting her on the back as she's shaking her head like this. She thought I went crazy. She went into her bedroom and she did a rosary for me because she knew her son had finally just gone over. She was so afraid. That was my mom. My sister Madeline went to her bed. It was late. She went to bed and she said, whatever you did to my brother, do that for me. And my sister Madeline gave her heart to Christ that same night. She gave her heart to Jesus Christ. Three weeks later is when I'm sharing with my parents out of Revelation 9 
and I open the Bible, read the portion to my dad, and say to him, Dad, you are a good man. You, will be the be you are the best man I will ever know, but you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. I said, I love you, Daddy, and I don't want to go to heaven without you. Bow your head. You're giving your heart to Christ right this minute. And my dad and my mom, that's how they came to faith in Christ. They bowed their head and they gave their heart to Jesus Christ. Then my sister, my, rather my brother Frank, a couple years later, I went in the military, got out. I took him to church one night. And my brother Frank, August 4th, 1974, gave his heart to Jesus Christ. He needed a Bible study. So I started teaching a Bible study at his house in the city of Ontario. He invited workers. A young woman named Marie shows up. Two weeks later, three weeks later, Marie gives her heart to Jesus Christ. My sister Becky enters in a lesbian relationship and a lesbian lifestyle and, and stays there over 20 years. She says something like 27 years. She comes to a, 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 an Easter service here. I give a, an invitation. She lives in New Mexico. I didn't even know she was here. She gives her heart to Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. You take it and you give it. God has called us to take this message out, not to keep it in these four walls, but to tell our family, our friends, those who we live next to, you know, the neighbors, the, the people we work with, when given opportunity, no, I'm not saying shove the gospel down their throat, but he says a wise scribe will take it out and will give it. That's what I've been doing now for many years, since 1970, is taking the word and giving it to people. Don't be afraid. Tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. I said to Dad, I don't want to go to heaven without you. Daddy, you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. Don't be changing the word of God to suit the ears of the hearer. Just tell the truth. Jesus cared. Jesus said, this is what happens. The end of the age, the angels come. They sort out these fish. And the, the ones that are, 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 are not right, they will enter into judgment. People don't want to hear that. I understand. Everybody goes to heaven in the United States, right? Even your dogs and parakeets, right? Everybody goes to heaven. But that's not what Jesus taught. If, if, if everybody just, just went to heaven, why preach? Why share? Why did Paul go everywhere? Why did he make it his aim to preach the name of Christ where the name had never been proclaimed? Why did you do that, Paul, if everybody's going to go to heaven? Why did you care? Because that is not what's going to happen. It's going to happen where that the, the angels will come. They will take those. They will sort them out. Some enter into judgment, and Jesus said, it's eternal. That ought to motivate us to love our friends and our family. Love them enough to tell them the truth. Tell them that God loves them. Tell them that Jesus died on a cross for them. Tell them that he was buried, but he was raised the third day. Tell them that the Holy Spirit will indwell them. Their lives can be changed. They can have purpose. They can have peace. They can have joy. They can know what love is. Tell them that their families can be salvaged that God can do a work, that the, that the hypocrite can be changed to be sincere, that the drug addict can be set free, that the alcoholic can become a good father or a good mother. Tell them what God can do. Take it out of these four walls and tell somebody that God loves them because that's what Jesus taught us to do. That's a fact. That's what he said. And we need to not only learn, but we need to distribute and we do so as a wise individual. There are times when the Lord gives to us opportunity and he says, speak. There are times when he says, I'm holding you back. Just be waiting on the Lord. You see, one last thing and then we'll close. I'm not saying go to work and don't work, just preach, become, you know, just, no, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Be the best worker on the job site. Be the best worker on the job site. Be the most honest. Be on time. Work a full day. Leave on time. Don't take extra breaks. Don't rip off your employer. Don't, don't be giving out dirty stories. And don't be listening to them either. Just be a man. Be a woman with integrity. So that they'll see that. And they'll say, there's something different about you. There's something different. I don't know what you say. Well, it's just you're different. You're different. 
I'm a Christian. Yeah, 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 we all are. What you're seeing is the Lord working in my heart. Really? Somebody just came yesterday. Yesterday. And we're talk, they were talking to someone after a funeral that we had just yesterday. Dear servant, and served in this fellowship for many years, went home to be with the Lord, and a great number of people showed up, and not every one of them had gone to this fellowship. And one was speaking to somebody after the funeral service and said, I have never been around a group of people like this before. It makes me think I could be one of these. I could be a Christian because she was seeing love in action. She saw love in action because all these people who cared about this friend of hers, she wasn't even aware that there were people like that. You know, they watch TV and they see these caricatures of a Christian. They see somebody with a Bible holding it up, yelling out, yeah, I believe this is the best book. I was given to me by my family, blah, blah, blah. Then a moment later, they're gossiping about somebody or swearing or whatever, and they say, if that's what a Christian is, then I must already be one because that's what I do do. But when they see somebody who loves and cares, when they see somebody who serves, is generous, has charitable heart towards people and all, speaks the truth, does so in love, has concern for their eternity, and that's different. And that's what God has called us to do. And that's what God has called us as believers to be. Now, it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. So he's leaving. He gave eight parables there in the city of Capernaum. And he's leaving Capernaum. And he's on his way now to the city of Nazareth. And we will be looking at the response to Jesus in his home city next time we get together. Father, we pray that you would work in our hearts, even right now, as we have come to this place and we have heard your word, we would ask that you would have your way amongst us. And even as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, perhaps there are some in this room right now, the Spirit of God is speaking to you. You need to get right with the Lord and you know it. And so as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you need prayer, you need to get right with him. Would you raise your hand and let me pray for you? Just where you're at, raise your hand that I might see you and pray for you. Father, you see these hands going out throughout this place right now. And I'm asking that you would reach down and you would touch them. Their hearts are opening to you. And I'm asking that you would settle on them. And Lord, I ask that your word would find a home in them and that they would begin from this point on to live for you. Thank you for the washing and the cleansing of the blood of Christ, the newness of life that we have as you forgive us our sins. Thank you that we now are becoming your temple and your spirit will dwell in us. We ask that we would hunger and thirst after you, your righteousness, and that we would pursue you from this moment on. We give you praise and we give you thanks as we turn from our sin, we forsake it, and we turn to you. And bless you, Lord, and thank you. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, I ask that you keep moving in all of us to your glory, in your name. Amen. Let's all stand. Now remember, Jesus asked the question, have you understood all these things? Did that make sense to you today? Did it? I hope so. I hope so. May the Lord work in us. And remember, we have a service tonight. We have a service Wednesday. Don't be a stranger to your church. Come and spend time with us. Get in the word with us.